For it to be a great illuminating uh, conversation and one that is very much needed. Um, and uh, as we proceed, you can um, put your question for our panelists in the chat function. I will have some time after the panel to get to those questions. Um, and to kick things off, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Nefli Danier. Good evening, everyone. And it's so great to have you all with us this evening for what is like my colleague said to be an enlightening conversation. And as we begin, please allow me to introduce to you our panelists and our moderator. Our first panelist is Hayden Green. Hayden Green is currently the Director of Multicultural Affairs at Manhattan College and oversees the Multicultural Center. He is working to develop inclusion workshops involving students, faculty, and administrators. He collaborates with the college's student life directors to develop peer leadership groups and diversity events that complement the college's existing clubs and programs. With the center, Green has created a space that is welcoming to all identities and cultures and provides learning opportunities to those looking to expand their boundaries. Hayden is a prize-winning fine art photographer with an eye for ironic and for color. He has been a working professional since 2008 and strives to capture the unnoticed beauty that we walk by every day. Hayden earned his bachelor's degree at Baruch College in 1996 and his master's degree at Montclair State University. Welcome, Mr. Hayden Green. And our next panelist is Andrew Lawton. Andrew is a Percy E. Sutton seat counselor, providing academic, personal, and professional counseling for Baruch students. Additionally, he serves as the program director for the Percy E. Sutton Sikhs Urban Male Leadership Academy Scholars Program, which serves to develop and promote the academic excellence, social consciousness, and leadership skills of Black and Latino male college Sikh students. Andrew has worked in education and social services for over 15 years, encompassing youth development, child welfare, outpatient medical health, anti-racism, community service, advocacy, and leadership development. Andrew is a graduate of Syracuse University with a BS in television, radio, and film production. He also earned a master's in social work from Hunter College School of Social Work in New York City. Andrew continues to nurture his interest in art and media in his work with students. Welcome, Andrew. And our next panelist is Davon Thompson. From growing up in a marginalized community afflicted with visible healthcare disparities to developing actionable strategies that raise awareness and bridge healthcare gaps within similar communities at his agency, Satachi and Satachi Wellness, Davon takes pride knowing that his everyday work is purpose driven and has the potential to change and save lives. Outside of his office, you can easily find Davon giving back to students across the country, teaching them the essential skills they need for a successful career. As a strategic partnership lead at 100 Roses from Concrete, the premier network for men of color within the marketing agent industry, he and his fellow Roses ideate and create campaigns and programs with the potential to change the marketing industry through the power of diversity and inclusion. Davon earned his bachelor's degree at Baruch College in 2019. Welcome, Davon. And our moderator for this evening is Professor Jamel Coy Hudson. Jamel is a lecturer of rhetoric and public advocacy in the Department of Communication Studies at Baruch College. He earned an EDS in education leadership from Regent University and his BA and MA with distinction in rhetorical studies from Hofstra University. Jamel joined Baruch College after beginning his teaching career at Hofstra University, where he was an adjunct assistant professor in the writing studies and rhetoric department and faculty tutor in the Hofstra Writing Center. He is an accomplished rhetorician with experience presenting at the National Communication As Association Conference, the Character.org National Forum Conference, and the Mid-Atlantic Writing Center Association Conference. At Baruch College, he teaches courses in speech communication, classical rhetoric, and persuasion. 
Welcome, Jamal, and I turn it over to you now. Mother, mother, there's too many of you crying. And brother, 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 there's far too many of you dying. You know we've got to find a way to bring some love in here today. Oh, 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 Father, Father, we don't need to escalate. Listen, war is not the answer, for only love can conquer hate. You know we've got to find a way to bring some love in here today oh 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 a picket lines picket signs i don't punish me with brutality come on and talk to me so you can see what's going on what's going on oh what's going on I want to know what's going on. I just want to have a little fun tonight. Thank you. I want to have a little fun tonight. We're just having a good time. We're going to have a discussion. We're going to have a lot of fun. And we're going to hopefully have a chat and a dialogue and hear from some great talented men I've met. I've met some interesting, interesting men at my time here at Baruch and I'm gonna shut this music off and good evening. It's 6.07, we are starting our event. I am truly privileged <clears throat> and honored to have the opportunity to moderate this event. My name is Jamel Koya Hudson. I'd like to officially welcome you to the Robert C. Weaver Society and Black Male Initiative at Baruch College panel discussion entitled Walking in my shoes, the black male perspective. What's going on? Glad to see so many faces here. There's a lot of participants. There's a lot of um, people who've taken time out of their schedules to be here to talk about a very important topic. Um, I want to start by thanking the Assistant Director of Alumni Relations, Neftali. Thank you for your great work. Thank you for, if you don't know her, you should give her a round of applause. <laughs> really great team. And Miss Ali as well. Also want to thank my friend and colleague at the Black Male Initiative, Mr. P.J. Hill. I know he's around here somewhere. want to thank him as well as we get started for our uh, discussion today. I'd like to begin our discussion today by offering up an old American proverb that simply said, don't judge a man until you've walked a mile in his shoes. Each of us are gathered in this Zoom meeting and we've all walked different paths and journeys on our life and we've used our feet as means of transportation. Some of our feet have shoes that are well equipped to navigate the tumultuous at times roads of life, the meandering roads and narrow roads of this life. Well, there are others that haven't been so fortunate. Some have confronted obstacles that have hindered their access to sturdy, dependable shoes simply because of characteristics such as race, gender, economic status in society. When this nation declared its independence from Britain, from Britain excuse me, and the founding fathers etched the majestic words of the, and the Declaration of Indep Independence and ratified the Constitution and stated that all men were created equal, well, black men weren't included in that all. And since the founding of this nation, so many black men have had to encounter roadblocks, stumbling paths, potholes that have tried to uh, push back and not allow them upward mobility in this society. Well, those of you who are here today are in for a treat. We have a great panel, great men I had the opportunity to meet who are going to share with us their own experiences as black men. We're not going to abstractly speak about what's going on in society. We have three brothers who are going to allow us to take an opportunity to enter into their world. They, the proverb I gave you, you don't know, you shouldn't judge a man until you walk the mile in his shoes. Well, I'd like to ask all of you to join us on a journey. We're gonna go for a little walk 
and Neftali did introduce them. I want to greet them as well. We have Mr. Hayden, we have Mr. Davon, and we have Mr. Andrew with us today. Man, we've been getting to know each other. They have a lot of great things, a lot of great nuggets of knowledge they can give to us. So let's go on this journey together. Gentlemen, are you ready? Audience, are you ready? We're going to go for a stroll. And I have some questions I'm going to ask. So if you can, please keep your mics muted. Uh, Ali, who's doing a great job, is going to direct any questions you do have for the, for the panelists to the chat. Okay, but I'm going to ask them and they're going to have their mics off and you all are going to be as flies on the wall and just see the discussion and hopefully at the end be able to hear, listen and understand. Okay. So, gentlemen, here we go. How you doing? Can I just check a mic? One, two. Mr. Hayden, how you doing? Davon, how you doing? Andrew, how you doing? Doing well. Doing well. Doing good, brother. All right, well. let's get started. I'm excited. I have a first question on series. I have some themes, but I'd like to start in the beginning. Before you all became the successful Black men that you are today, each of us at one point were Black children, young Black boys playing with toys. And I'm a huge believer that the house that we're born into, the environment that we're born into, plays a formidable role in shaping who we are today. So many young Black boys are born into vicious cycles of poverty, and, and the shoes that they've inherited uh, are already damaged have holes in them and don't allow the adequate support that's needed to help them walk at times this lonely road of life. I can say for myself, I've been very fortunate. I've been the recipient of privilege and I acknowledge it and I do my best to use my privileges to serve. Uh, when people ask me how I got here today, I make it very clear that I'm here because of God's grace, my parents' love and the support I received from a community of people. Okay, my beautiful black mother, she loves me. The faith in God I received from the black church grounds me and the wise teachings my father instilled in me on how to navigate in society, to deal with the police. It, it really has kept me grounded. So gentlemen, if you can, please take a moment and reflect and then candidly respond and share with us how the environment you were born into has shaped your perspective and understanding of your own black male identity. And I'm going to ask Mr. Davon, sir, if you would answer that question for us to get us started on our journey this evening. Sir, go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you, Jamal. I really appreciate you know prepping us for this. Uh, I, I guess I guess if I were to encapsulate it into one word, I would say it was treacherous. Uh, if if you are all familiar with Harlem, you know, you go there now and it looks nice. There's condominiums, there's, you know, you got the, 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 the cupcake shop on the corner, probably, you know, people walking their dogs, jogging in the middle of the night. If you know 90s Harlem, it's a completely different ball game, you know, um, gang activity, substance abusers, um, and, and, and much, much, much more, you know, abandoned houses that you know playing as kids and parks you know open lots all that uh and it's kind of like that today but on a much more scaled down level and Did we you know yeah yeah i'm sorry i don't have the best connection but to to, to continue my train of thought um you know it was, it was treacherous it was not the safest area to live in you don't have that many role models and i i guess i guess to, to add on to that perspective, you know, I was fortunate enough to be able to go to an elementary school that was on the Upper West Side. So, you know, uh, wealthy white families that they would send their kids there. So I was able to see a contrast during the day when I was in school from eight o'clock to three o'clock of kids and talking about, oh, we're going to our summer home for, you know, summer vacation and my dad is a doctor and, you know, all that. And I'm like, I don't know about all that. And then I go home at three o'clock in the evening and, you know, I see substance abusers, you know, strung out on the street, on the corner. So you can imagine what that does to, uh, you know, a five-year-old, you know, whenever I was able to remember that, that's from as far back as I can remember, you know, my area was always like that. And to see it progress into what it is now due to gentrification, best friends getting kicked out of their homes, uh, having to move elsewhere, friend groups getting smaller and smaller, and just being able to see it from a different perspective, because of course, where I went to school at and seeing what, you know, my friends in school were like and what they were going through, and then my friends from around the way. So it was definitely treacherous, and I think that it gave me a truly unique perspective as I started to grow up and get up in age. 
Well, thank you, sir, for starting us off. Thank you for your candor and diving right into the question. Uh, gentlemen, as we chat, please, if you would like, I'm going to go through everyone's um, answers. Don't feel rushed. Not, hey, Devon, you took all the time that you need, and you always can do that. So I'm just going to go through everyone, and then we can chat among, uh, about these questions. I'm going to turn now to Mr. Hayden Green. Sir, same the question I asked him. Um, speak about how the environment you were born into, sir, shaped your understanding of your Black male identity. So it's yours. You're going to require me to go back and remember when I was a kid, right? Okay, great. <laughs> uh, I've gotten up in age, and uh, and 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 that that used to be a, a, a an achievement for a black man. So I'm I'm happy to be the age that I am. But um, my mom was a, a single mom, um, and uh, I was born in London, England, and uh, and my mom, uh, f my family is from Trinidad, and so my mom came here after she got her nursing degree, and then. When she got here, uh, I was around nine years old and, and she started to realize, this is in the 70s now, and she started to realize that uh, New York City wasn't the greatest place to, to raise a young black boy. And so my grandmother was returning to our home in Trinidad. And so she sent me back home to grow up with my grandmother. And uh, for those of you who ever grew up with Big Mama, you'll know that uh, th that's a different kind of strict, right? So there was, there, there were very little variances in, in, in what I could do and between like, you know, trying to, trying to be bad. And like my, my grandmother famously said that I was given this child and I I'm going to return this child in the same way that I was given this child. And so I was... Uh, I, I was, I had a strict up, upbringing, you know, I grew up in the Catholic church. I, I was an acolyte. I was in the choir. I don't know why I was in the choir because I can't sing. Um, but the, 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 the mindset was, we're going to give you everything that you need in order to be a well-formed human. And when you get to be older, you can make decisions as to what you are going to do down and what you're going to pick up and what you're going to go with. But her job and her mind was to make sure that I had all the tools that I needed. So I learned how to wash my clothes. I learned how to iron my clothes. I learned how to cook. I learned how to clean and do all of these different things because um, it was a matter, she understood that uh, at a certain point in time, I was going to need to fend for myself and I needed to have as many tools as a black man in today's society to be successful. And she wanted to make sure that she had laid the foundation and the groundwork. And so understanding your skills and understanding the, the need to learn and to, and to develop oneself and, and understanding how to be self-sufficient was always in the back of my mind. And so when I returned to the States, that was like at, at, at the forefront, right? And so I returned to the States when I was around 19 and started Baruch. And, uh, and, and that was one of the things that was always at my, in my mind. It's like, I got all the tools. I need to use them properly because um, I have a limited amount of time to get this stuff done. You know, they, they've, uh, the, the old saying is youth is wasted on the young. And, and that was very, very, very present in my mind that I needed to get stuff done. Mr. Hayden, thank you, sir, for sharing. You make me think uh, the old proverb that says, train up a child in the way he should and he should not depart, right? You definitely had the, the, the teaching instilled from Big Mama of how to work in life. I really appreciate that. Uh, and thank you, sir, for sharing. Let's go to Mr. Andrew, sir. Same question. I'll propose it one more time. Can you candidly speak, sir, about the environment you were born into and how that shaped your understanding of your Black male identity? Floor is yours, sir. Thank you. Uh, just very honored to be here. And very similarly to, to Hayden, it was um, a lot of discipline. Uh, and so, so I'm from Cambridge Heights, Queens, uh, here in New York City. Um, and in thinking about how I wanna talk about this was, um, some of my first memories was with being in my mother's arms and her rocking me and telling me how beautiful my skin was and how beautiful I am. And, and so that, so, so, so it was just really normalized as, as a black man that, you know, like I, I am, I'm beautiful. And, and so it was just, you know, now 
as a grown man, like I, I, I realized how much that it was this protection that she was kind of just like this, this, this force field that she was putting around me. And, um, and I really appreciate it at this point in my life and going through all the things that have gone through. Um, you know, to the point where my parents, you know, you know, they, they decided to uh, figure out a way to get us brown powder and brown band-aids. You know, I had a Jet magazine or Ebony bag. I don't know where she ordered it from, but like, you know, like that was that was what I had. So when I, when I was in school and got like a, a, a peach band-aid on me, I was just like, I don't know what that is. Like at home, I get brown band-aids, and so the normalizing of it, and then also just the sitting um, at the table for dinner and talking about our days, what'd you learn today? And just really getting to just like build this, this family and community. Um, similarly to Aiden, I was like raised in a Catholic church, you know, um, and the, that spiritual background, you know, it's definitely have a lot of conflicts with it, but, but you know, that being the origin of, um, you know, having, having that ritual and us doing this as, as, as a family together was, was helpful. Um, and then getting an opportunity to, to say, you know what, that's not what I want to participate in anymore and not being supported and knowing that like my leaving that was not just, it was not saying that I'm leaving the family, it's saying that that is not my practice. But like I'm still here and we're still here together as a family. Uh, and then um, also moving out of New York City. And so I moved to California for, for five years and lived in Oakland and worked in San Francisco and then came back before I came back to New York. And how, you know, I was 22 when I left and young man just trying to figure out, you know, uh, my way through. And I, and I remember the day when I decided that I was going to move, um, you know, my parents, they weren't necessarily, in my opinion, they may think otherwise, and they're here, by the way, so um, on this call, um, is that, but I remember my father said to me that, you know, when, when I told him that this is what I was going to do, and I was clear about it. He was like he wasn't worried anymore, and and I and I and I bring that up is that the that they knew that well we we've done we've done what we can you know and and if we believe that we've done a good job then he's going to make the right decisions and if this is the right decision for him then this is what he's going to do and he's going to be okay and so um, so yeah so all the all those things have played into. Um, who I am today and why um, I'm so happy to be here with you all. Andrew, thank you so much for answering. And hello, mama. Hello, daddy. I'm so glad to know that your parents are here there. You should be proud. I've got an opportunity to meet Mr. Andrew as I've worked and navigated Baruch, a, a great man. So we thank you for being here, all who are in attendance. And again, if you have questions as they begin to formulate, drop them in the chat because we're going to continue with our discussion. But I know if you have something, we're getting ready to leave housing upbringing, we're getting ready to go to the next section. But if you have something that's pertinent to something that maybe was said by our three awesome panelists, please do not forget to write it in the chat. Gentlemen, let's move on. I'll stroll to another topic. I want to talk education. Now, each of us are in some way connected to Baruch College. We have proud graduates. We have, uh, you know, directors of programs here at the institution. I myself am a full-time faculty member, and I believe we all understand the power of educational attainment and its ability to open doors that no man can close. You know, Malcolm X once said that education is the passport to the future, for tomorrow belongs to those who prepare for it today. Dr. King spoke about education's ability to help people think critically and analytically and use their character to guide the decisions that they make. Unfortunately, there are many young Black men that don't see the college experience as a viable option for them. Factors and barriers in life have made many feel as though that their shoes shouldn't step feet within the, uh, the halls of academia. So my first question to you three is this, and we'll reverse engineer the order. I'll go to Mr. Andrew first. First, sir, are you a first generation uh, college graduate? 
And then uh, I'd like for you to um, offer some words of encouragement based off your experiences to any person. But, you know, how can they uh, muster up the courage and strength to be the person in their family to break that and be the, the, the graduate that attains uh, that higher education degree? Mr. Andrew, sir, the floor is yours. Thank you. So, um, so I'm not a first generation. Uh, both of my parents, so my mother uh, graduated Queens College and Pops is a Baruch College graduate. Um, so, uh, and many of the family have um, gone through the CUNY system. And um, so, yeah, so I, I, I'm very, very proud of being a Baruch and um, and also as a Hunter College graduate as well from Latin MSW. So, um, so it, the, the second question was around words of um, advice. You said, yes, sir. Okay. So in that, it, it, the road, the road can be hard, uh, and I have felt that you need to have a community of people around you to support you that they get what you're doing. And so, um, so that when you are saying like, I need to go do this, whether it's study, whether it is, um, I need to have a meeting, do whatever you need to do, is that other people understand that you're not just trying to not be involved if people don't understand the path uh, that, that, that you're going on. Um, and then also giving you the space. So if you need quiet time, and I'm understanding, it's like I'm I'm trying to digest something. I'm I'm in I'm in thought. So like, what are you doing? You're not doing anything. You have free time. You're not in class. You're not writing. It's like, but I'm but I'm thinking. And how much time, as you're trying to understand? Because one of the things that um, I talk a lot about with the students is, you know, and, and I really feel like as a, as an educator that I've gotten through to them is because they have said that, you know, I, I could pass this class, but I haven't learned what I came here to learn and how much they are invested in the learning and how many students go through school. And so that I could pass this class and but they don't know anything once they pass. And so what I'm saying is like remembering that and grounding yourself that if you are be, if you're going to show up here you're here to to learn and um i know there's a lot of talk i've gotten into with students about rate my professor and all that stuff and i was like you're looking for the easy a you need to run towards the instructors that are going to hold your feet to the fire around learning because when you get when you when you move on and you meet somebody like us here that uh, you'd be like, well, you have a degree and, you, and what do you know? And if you don't know it, then that degree doesn't really mean anything. And so really, really wanting you to be grounded in, like I'm here, I'm here to, to learn. And so that is, that is, you know, the support system and learning is that, that is, that is the biggest advice. I know in my graduate program, that, that was what I did. I ran towards um, my, my, my professor, uh, Dr. Samuel Amer, you know, at Hunter College, who was, was, was tough. And I decided to take him as much as I could, because I knew that if I could get through and be successful in his class, that I could sit at any table and no one's going to be able to tell me anything because he, he put the screws on us, you know, and, and I did well. So that's my advice. Thank you, sir, for the insight. I really appreciate you mm -hmm. uh, answering with, with complete candor. Really appreciate you. I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Hayden, and I'll ask the question again, sir. Are you a first-generation college graduate? And then what advice would you give to a young Black male considering higher ed or in the journey, maybe at a fork in the road and needs some encouragement and needs to hear some remarks from you? Go ahead, sir. The floor is yours. Yeah, I'm definitely a first generation college graduate. Uh, as I mentioned, my, my mom is has a nursing degree. It's not a BS, but she had a nursing degree at the time. So she wasn't a stranger to uh, post-secondary education. So, uh, so she understood uh, that, again, this was the pathway to success, that you can't take an education away from somebody, right? You can get a job, but once you, you know, having an education will guarantee that you will always have a career. It's that whole give a man a fish or teach a man how to fish. Um, and so the 
interesting thing about, uh, you know, this idea of, of going to school and finishing uh, is based in how we acculturate Black men and, and what they uh, are supposed to be, right? So they're supposed to be breadwinners. They're supposed to um, make that paper, right? And so college is a dream deferred. College is earning capacity deferred. And a lot of times it is hard to sit in a class about art history and understand how this has anything to do with the end game of me making that paper, right? And so a lot of people fail out or flame out because I've, I've got to get to that money earning um, point faster. And uh, so you see a lot of people either leave college and, and uh, do nefarious things or leave college and, and go off and to do civil work, uh, civil jobs. Those are great jobs, right? But a lot of those, that, a lot of that motivation is based on how do I earn money now? I can't put this off to four years. And this is even more made more treacherous where we have students who are going through the collegiate experience now and watching a, the generation before them have built up all of this student debt and still not be able to get jobs, right? So it's a very, very steep mountain. And, and at some point in time, you, you know, you feel like Sisyphus, right? Because you're const constantly pushing this up and you never really know whether or not you're going to get this boulder over the hill. And so that's daunting. And so one of the things that you have to be able to do is pull back and pull back the lens and let people see it's like, look, if you leave now, this is your earning capacity. If you stick it out, and if you, you, you know, just a mere fact of sticking it out, again, is character building. If you can put your mind to it and, and, and defer that desire to be a, a breadwinner, your earning capacity is going to be so much more, right? And so, so that's one piece of it. The other piece is trying to get them to understand, especially during the time that they're doing their core classes, get them to understand that, yeah, I know with, with you're learning right now about like physics or chemistry and and you're not going to, and you don't think that you're ever going to use calculus in your life ever again. I will, t I put it to people that if for nothing else than having a conversation with a fellow graduate about, have you ever used calculus? It is part of becoming a citizen of the world, understanding the world around you and understanding that everybody has a baseline of understanding at a certain level. And if you breeze through it and don't, as you know, Andrew was talking about, actually get the learning, get the understanding of what it is that you're going through. You're going to be in situations where um, you're, going to, you're going to think that this is a growth opportunity for you and you don't have the, the basic tools to have a conversation. And, and there is a, there's an old maxim that deals are not made in boardrooms, deals are made on the golf course. And what that speaks to is that the socializ socialization of the, the business world is not something that's done, you know, in, in, in these business situations that you see on TV. That socialization is done at a bar, as socialization is done um, at, at the, the company mixer. And if you can't hold a conversation, and sometimes a conversation is about something that you really maybe don't have an interest in, but because you took the time to add as many tools to your toolbox as you possibly could, you fit yourself into a situation. But if you pass over that stuff and decide that that's not going to be something that you can, that, that's useful to you, when you get into those situations, you won't have those tools. And again, it's all about putting tools in that toolbox. And, and sometimes... It really, you need a, a professor or, or some, you know, I had Dr. Lewin, you know, you, you mentioned your, your professor, Dr. Lewin was my guiding, uh, my guiding light, right? Like Dr. Lewin, even if you weren't taking his class, he was, what are you up to? What are you doing? How are you making yourself better? Um, you know, and it didn't matter whether or not you was taking that particular subject. He wanted to make sure that he saw that, look, this is a young black man that's coming through Baruch and he's going to need somebody to look out for him. Right, and I was raised by by a village, you know, in in my family, but I was also raised by a village at Baruch, um, and so sometimes it looked like Dr. Lewin 
steadying my course, but it also looked like Dean Sam Johnson making sure that my co-curricular and my, and, and my actual work were in balance and I wasn't going to fail out and, and major in spades in the Oak Lounge, right? Um, Cause that almost happened. Uh, but, uh, and then we also had people like Carl Ailman, who was the director of student activities back then, who is the reason that I'm in the field right now, because I saw that as somebody who had stayed the course and had utilized all of his education um, and funneled it into what he was passionate about. And that passion really helped all of us to be fully actuated people at Baruch. So, um, my advice to anybody going through any kind of collegiate experience is you got to find your steadying force. You got to find that one professor, that one administrator who you can be like, uh, I'm, I don't know how I'm feeling about that. And they can smack you in the back of the head and be like, here's where you need to go. Or here are some options for you to consider because it's hard doing it by yourself, especially if you don't have a, you know, a, 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 a parental uh, unit that has gone through it before you. Man, you dropped so many nuggets in the chat box. It's exploding right now. There's so many great things. When you mentioned Dr. Lewin, everybody's hands go up. Let me tell you, we really appreciate the work and contribution he's made to making Baruch uh, an inclusive, great uh, uh, place for us to learn and grow. Uh, Mr. Davon, same question I'll ask. You're a first-generation college student, sir. And then what advice would you give to an up-and-coming high school senior, maybe someone who took a couple of years off from, you know, wants to get back to the school grind. What were you? What would you say about your experience? What nuggets of knowledge can you share with us tonight? The floor is yours. Absolutely. Uh, first and foremost, shout out to Dr. Lewin. I was my favorite professor when I was at Baruch. Truly, you know, he's been able to help me out in so many different ways. You know, in small conversations and long, you know, just just streams of consciousness conversations. You know, shout out to him. Uh, to, to answer your question, as far as it goes for me being a first generation uh, college student, yes, my parents unfortunately didn't have the opportunity to go to college, um, but my older brother uh, went to college before me, so it wasn't as daunting as it would have been if I was the first person in my family to go to college. He was able to uh, guide me, uh, help me even uh, you know, change my major. Initially, I wanted to go into school for cooking. I went to culinary uh, high school, specialized high school, and I wanted to go to uh, CIA, the Culinary Institute of America. But he ended up changing my mind. He said, hey, Davon, you know, you're, you're good at cooking. This is amazing. You can definitely pursue a career in this and succeed well into the future doing this. But Think of other things that you can learn to augment that so that you can transform that. So would you rather be someone who cooks in someone else's kitchen or would you want to go into marketing, maybe become an entrepreneur and own your own kitchen? So from there, I ended up going to uh, City Tech in Brooklyn. And after doing my two years there, I ended up here at Baruch. And it, it was a great experience. You know, it, it, was, it was a very interesting experience. I'm not too sure what it was like for Andrew or Hayden when you were at Baruch. I hear that it was much more, you know, uh, Black students there from the Caribbean, you know, African-American, Afro-Latinos, whatever the case may be. But when I went, there weren't many. The only time I would see, you know, an abundance of Black students was in Dr. Lewin's class. But when I went to my major classes, you know, um, business, whatever, 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 I was the only black kid there. And maybe there were one or two other ones, but it, 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 it honestly was just me. And it was a very interesting experience because you look around the classroom and you're like, whoa, where are all the black people at? Is it gonna be like this when I enter the workforce? And yes, indeed, it was when I entered the workforce. It was just like that. Uh, so I would say two pieces of advice for someone who is a person of color going through the, you know, their, 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 their current college experience and wanting to get back into college or whatever it may be. The first thing that you want to do is identify a role model that you can look up to. I think that Dr. Lauren was that perfect role model. He was able to give me the empowerment to do well in my career, 
but also to do well in my career as a black man, to be able to drop all the gems necessary for me to empower myself and feel confident to go into the world as well as the workforce, knowing my history, knowing what it's like to be a black person in America, knowing what it's like to go through the pains and motions of, you know, being in a system that is truly created against you. So identifying that role model that you can look up to, who you can speak to, who you can in some ways imitate, uh, you know, um, so that you can become the best person that you can is great. Uh, I would say three, a matter of fact. The second point that I would like to make is understanding why you're doing this. Of course, you don't have to go to college. You know, there's plenty of other ways to become successful by not going to college, but understand how far a degree can get you. Um, you know, what it looks like as a Black person to have a degree and say, I did this, like I mentioned before, my parents didn't necessarily go to college. So for my kids to be able to say, oh, my father went to college, you know, that's a big deal, especially within the Black community. Uh, so understanding who you're doing it for, being that role model of encouragement for the people that come after you, because we all have people that we look up to, and by going to college and finishing it and becoming successful in whatever you decide to do really empowers people. When you don't see someone who looks like you in high places, it's hard to believe that you'll be able to get there. But when you have, even if it's one, two, or three, and hopefully in the future, it's a ton of us up there, it definitely makes a difference. And we feel good about that. And it makes us see, wow, he can do it. I can do it. The third thing that I would say is building a strong support group. And, you know, Andrew and Hayden touched on this, but I think that's an imperative for us within the Black community, even on top of that, within just the general people of color community, to have that strong support network starting in college. Because you're thinking about it. You have tons of kids that are ambitious and wanting to become something with their lives. And by surrounding yourself with those same people, you're able to get that energy. You're able to bounce ideas off of them and maybe even go into business with them. You may hear about certain events from your friends who are on the right path. You know, you may get job opportunities from friends that you may meet in college. And the list goes on. Uh, it's, 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 it's unfortunate, but, you know, many Black households don't necessarily have, you know, you don't have a father or a mother who's well connected with people in the business world. And, you know, you have other families who are like that. So by you building up that support group, you're able to catch up to, you know, other people who may have had those sad experiences of their father knows somebody or their mother knows somebody. On top of that, your children that'll come after you will then have, you know, the friends that you were able to make to tap into. Maybe they can do favors. They can hook up your son or daughter with an internship. So think about it in a long game of how it can benefit yourself, but also those that come after you. And it's just that sense of community when you're around people, you know, like I recommend everyone who's entering college to join a club because, you know, it, it just gives that sense of camaraderie. It doesn't have to be a frat. It doesn't have to be anything like that, you know, but also just keep in mind when you join, because I know that a lot of those clubs on there, you know, they like to party and do all that crazy stuff. That's fine. Once in the blue moon, it's absolutely fine. But know why you're there. Know that you're there to make those connections, to become friends with people, to, you know, bounce ideas off of them, for you to be able to go into the workforce well-equipped with the right support group that if your company isn't working out well, you can reach out to one of your friends at that company and bounce over there whenever you need to. Or if there's an event going on or even a speaking opportunity, they'll be able to look towards hey, Devon, I remember him from college, you know, he did da 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 You know, I'd love for him to speak on this panel because I think that he'd be perfect. He's well-versed in this topic. Let's bring him on. So uh, those are the three points I would really, really, really recommend to anyone getting back into college or starting their college experience. Hey, thank you, gentlemen. And you touched on a lot of what I wanted to talk about uh, on the idea of role modeling and seeing people who look like you in the positions or professions you want to enter. And Hayden, you spoke about your experiences and the field you're in now and how 
Uh, we had role models. All of us had some interaction with Dr. Lewin. And it's great to have those intergenerational dialogues. I'm huge on mentorship and each one teach one. If you know better, you should do better. And you should give the nuggets and wisdom and knowledge you get from life to the generation following after you. So thank you all gentlemen for being role models in your own respective fields. I want to move now to a topic that's at times a little taboo. I want to talk about mental health. There's been a long standing stigma in, in the black community uh, on, on topics when we address mental health. And as a matter of fact, there's a lack of understanding in the entire American public discourse on mental health. But black Americans have a unique experience with science. The, the distrust that many black Americans have towards the healthcare field can be attributed to legitimate concerns based off of prior actions. You know, the inhumane treatment of Henrietta Lacks, the Tuskegee syphilis study, the, the, the foundational experiments uh, used on enslaved black women during the study of gynecology are just to name a few of why so many black Americans just reject the entire notion of seeking medical attention or assistance. This breakdown in trust, however, has led this breakdown in trust between physicians and patients has led to so many Black Americans suffering in silence. And in a society where Black boys are seen as, you know, threats and the color of their skin and makes them targets very early on in their life, many are forced to grow and mature quickly and not have opportunities to be vulnerable and to put down that guard of masculinity and ask for help. Gentlemen, I'd like to ask, what can we do to shift the narrative and open the door for a more transparent discussion on mental health in our communities? I think we'll reverse the order again. Let's go with Mr. Andrew, sir. What can we do to open the dialogue on mental health in our community, especially with our black boys and black men in our community, sir? Right. Thank you. Uh, that is, you know, it is why I wanted to go into social work is to address this issue. And that is, it's, it's, it's there. So people are, you know, we're hurting. Um, and if you don't address it directly, it's gonna manifest in some way, shape or form in your life and be very disruptive. So I, what, I saw so many students, so many people, peers, um, who, who are just not really embracing their greatness because they couldn't see themselves as great. And wanting and, and encouraging them, self-included, you know, and so it was like, well, well, how do I, how do we get to a, a better, healthier place? And it was just like, well, we're going to need to get help. And then this idea that um, asking for help seeking help is a sign of, of weakness. It is, you know, is just a very false narrative um, in, my, in my opinion, uh, because we, like we're hurting. And, and with, for all the reasons you just laid out, for, for all of that, and so you think about, so if we're coming from all of that, and then we're gonna be like, nah, I'm okay. Like, nah, like we're not, we're not okay and we need to do things to, to be okay. And so it can look differently for, for, for different people. So I'm not saying that it has to be uh, a prescribed way for every person, but, but to be able to get whatever support that you need. Um, mental health, um, so I worked for uh, a few years at an outpatient mental health clinic and you know worked with some uh, black men who who didn't want anyone to see them coming into that space because of all the things I just stated. But then when they get in the room and we close the door, and once they realized that I was not going to judge or demean them, belittle them, then it was just like the stuff came out. So I was just like, so, you, you, so you're this person outside, but you're really true, like, you, like you're a human being. And so, and you just, have not been able to have a space where you can just be in your full humanity. And, um, and when they left, it was just like, all right, kind of like, you know, wipe the tears from their eyes or whatever, blow their nose and be like, I, and then bounce, you know, like, and, and feeling like, well, um, that, that was a transform. It was transformative in both ways for me and for them. As in Santa, like wow. Outside of my, I haven't, I haven't had this kind of conversation 
with some of my closest friends, but I also, but I also saw them struggle, but I've had this conversation with strangers. And so I am saying that the, the mental health, like well, we need to get over and through the stigma around it and saying, because it's disrupting our communities and our families, how many, how many young people I've come in, it was like, well, my father's not there. You know, and your father's not there for a variety of reasons, and a lot of them come is because your 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 father has been indoctrinated with I can only express myself in just a couple of ways, in in maybe anger, you know, um, and and aggression, but I can't be sad, I can't be too happy because then if I'm too happy, then other things get tossed on me. I can't, you know, ex you know, I can't express anxiety, I can't express depression, like, however, those feelings still exist. And so, so to me, wanting to be in this field was to support uh, Black people to, particularly Black men, to be able to have a space to, to heal from that so, uh, so that we can uh, just build our community. So the, the mental health part is, is is you know, and I see so in, in the suffering in silence is is what happens because the you know if even if you ignore if you say that you're not feeling it, it manifests itself in some way, shape, or form in your life, um, and the people around you who love you, who care for you, um, are hurting because you're you, you're not fully showing up in a healthy way. So I'll stop there. Man, this is amazing. I'm seeing the the chats in the. In the, the comments in the chat box, please, this is amazing. Continue to write if you guys have questions. Mr. Davon, same question to you, sir. How do we shift the narrative and open up the door for a more transparent discussion on, on mental health in our communities, in particular with, with, with Black men? Floor is yours. Absolutely. Um, first and foremost, within the Black community, uh, you know, mental health is not it's, 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 it's bad. It's very, very, very stigmatized. You know, um, the first thing I think that everyone just thinks of when they think of, you know, mental health is this person is crazy, but it's more than that. It's much more broader than that. It's, you know, and it, it goes into even with therapists and, you know, oh, I need to go see a therapist. Nobody thinks of that because if I tell my friend that I'm going to go to a therapist because I'm going through some sort of form of emotions or whatever the case may be, they're probably going to make fun of me. They're probably going to tell my other friends, they're going to make fun of me. They're going to look at me different. I'll stay on going to a therapist, you know, so everything okay with him, you know, and it, rumors start to spread. And then eventually I just stopped going to the therapist because I think that it's, you know, um, not the right thing to do, but it is the right thing to do. You know, um, therapists are people who are outside of your friend group or outside of just your social circle, someone that, you know, you don't know that well, um, and you're able to speak with them one-on-one. -on -one. Stream of consciousness, speak your mind, talk about issues. It never leaves the room. And, you know, your therapist may be halfway across town, so at that, you know, nobody knows that person. So, you know, I think that doing it in a discreet manner, you know, definitely helps, but, you know, it doesn't necessarily help the narrative of, you know, going to a therapist being a good thing because it is a good thing. Uh, you know, and, and there's several, there's several factors that go into it. You know, I, I work in, in, in healthcare advertising for a particular. So, uh, one of the brands that I worked on in the past, uh, NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, you know, they definitely have a lot of materials and I've been able to do a lot of research into this topic and, you know, within the black community, uh, I, I guess I'll touch on a few things, you know, uh, I, I think, I think that it, it sometimes end up boiling down to a form of toxic masculinity. I'm just going to be honest. Uh, you know, if you're, if, if you're around your friends, you know, within the Black community, when, when you're a Black male, uh, and, you know, I'll speak for myself, and I'm sure that others can also agree with me on this, you know, you're, you're taught to be tough. You can't cry. You got to, you know, you, you're in a tough neighborhood. You have to be able to be that tough dude, you know, so nobody presses you nobody tries to push you around. And the moment you start to express that weakness, if you cry, 
if someone picks on you and says that you're not going to fight back or whatever the case may be, people automatically are going to think that you're weak. People are going to make fun of you. People aren't going to like you. You know, you're not going to have friends like that. And that takes a toll on your mental health from that perspective. But then when you also give into it, that also messes up your mental health because now you're in a constant state of, you know, just like, you know how they have flight or fight, fight. And that messes up your, your, your mental well-being. You know, you're always on edge. You're always, you know, trying to just, 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 just make it through the day. Uh, but it has a true mental strain on you. Uh, so that, that's something that I think really needs to, to, to be addressed within the Black community. Uh, and, and it's something that's not going to happen in a day or in a week, you know, it's going to take years and years and years of us just being comfortable with who we are and understanding, you know, what really makes a man a man, you know, you don't have to be the toughest dude to be the realest dude out there. And that's just a fact, you know, uh, and, you know, you also don't have to be afraid to cry or afraid to talk with someone about your problems or afraid to go to a therapist. Uh, one of the things that's really unfortunate being inside of the Black community, just in general with healthcare, there's a lot of disparities as far as it goes for getting great access, you know, uh, and having a doctor that can connect with you and having support groups and things of that nature. Uh, and even having doctors that look like you because it makes it that much more easier to speak with a doctor, um, you know, from, from my point of view, at least for me, that is Black, maybe versus that is white or Asian. If I have a Black doctor, initially, I'll probably think maybe they grew up in the same area as me. Maybe they understand the pains I've been through. So when I speak with them about this topic, they may be better equipped, even though another doctor may have that same degree, to be able to speak with me on this issue. Uh, and there's many different components that go into it. But I think that the first thing that needs to happen is shifting that narrative of what mental illness is, and maybe even changing the language of what mental illness is in general. Because when you think about illness, it's automatically associated with something bad. You know, I'm not too sure what it could be shifted to. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure that that's one way to start just the messaging that goes into, you know, just what it has, to, you know, the name of it and how we're addressing it. Uh, but then I think within the Black community, you know, just, just being able to have those conversations and identifying, you know, where the problems are and, you know, being able to speak with your friends and know that you know, being able to cry is fine. And knowing that if you speak with friends uh, that it's okay, because we all need support. We all go through tough times. We all have uh, a, a, a stint in our life that we're not, don't feel great, or that we feel bad and, you know, worse than that. But in, 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 in the grand scheme of things, if your mental wealth isn't good, you're not good. You're not going to be able to focus. You're not going to be able to live your best life. And it ends up attacking you if you get over it later in life. You know, there's certain triggers that can happen that have that snap right back to you. So I, I, I guess I guess I guess to wrap it up, it's, it's it's something that truly needs to be addressed. The narrative needs to shift. And I think that there are several ways that that can be shifted. Uh, but in order to get there, we just have to be able to come together and figure out what that right path is. Thank you, sir. And I agree with you. I think we need transparency and a, and a willingness to be vulnerable to have these, at times, difficult conversations. Mr. Hayden Green, sir, waiting there. And I'm going to ask you the same question. How do we shift that narrative and open the door for a more transparent discussion on mental health in our communities? The floor is yours. Yeah. So, you know, my master's is in, in counseling. So mental mental health and, and, and just mental wellness. It's, you know, just, you, you know, Devon, Devon you, you talk about rebranding it and really talking about health and, and being well is the piece where we need to get to that conversation. And the problem is, is that we start way too late telling people, telling black men that they need to invest in their feelings. Uh, we start early with young boys and telling them that they can't cry when they fall down. And we start early with little boys and telling them it's like, man up. And they're five years old. You know, let them be a kid. Let, let those emotions develop 
in these young boys. And there's this whole thing, and you know, Devon spoke to it about not being soft as a black man, but at a certain point in time, you have to let children be children. And it starts really, really, really easy. So allowing our young boys to be boys, uh, number one, uh, because the rest of the world is already looking at them as, as men, right? So we have to allow our young boys to be boys and stop calling them man, man, and stop calling them the, the man of the house and let them be boys. But also let them experience their emotions. Because if they don't get practice when they're developing their emotions, by the time that they are going to have to call on those emotions and be able to name them and be able to, to rectify them in their life, it'll be too late. And so I'm a huge advocate for that. Uh, and, and we as Black people are undergoing so many different uh, triggers from a number of different places. There was a recent article about the fact that dealing with racial discrimination and racial trauma and all the things that Black people have to deal with in this country uh, result in a condition that is similar to PTSD. And so we, we're people walking around as if we are in a war. And I'm not even going to talk about the war that's actually coming. Uh, but like we are people who are walking around as if we have been through a war. But like, and, and I'm from New York, where you good is the answer to the question, you good? Right? So like, you good? Nah, you good? Right? So like, nobody wants to talk about their feelings. And, and I think we get to the point, we have to, as Black men, have to get to the point where we are telling one another that it is okay to feel an emotion around me. Right. You can put up this front around the dudes, you know, standing outside the building or on, on the corner or whatever. But I will be your person. I will be the person that you can feel an emotion around me. Right. And uh, we have, uh, 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 you know, we, I have friends who when they get off the phone, we are grown black men. And when they get off the phone, it's like, yo, man, I love you. And I was like, yo, I love you, too, man. Right. And being able to sit in that word and being able to not have anything else stacked on top of that, except for the fact that you are a valued member of my community. And I love the fact that you are my friend and I love you for who you are. And I'm just going to leave that there and not have to have to explain all the rest of that stuff. That's that's something that we are we have to make normal. That's something that we have to get to as, as a society. Right. And so. I think that it is, uh, you know, and, and Devon talked a little bit about clubs and organizations and, and you know, and, and, and I'm a fraternity man. And you say what you want about clubs, organizations, fraternities, and whether or not they're a viable member of, of the, uh, the, the African experience. But I hug my frat brothers every time I see them, right? And, and it's not just a like, pat, pat, pat. It's a look. I'm happy you are around. I'm happy you are my brother. And I, I value your experience and I value your existence. And that goes so far, right? And so you, you, see, you, you see a lot of times when, you, when we have grown people who are part of uh, either gangs and stuff like that, they'll have these intricate hand, sign, hand, hand things, but they'll also end in a hug. And there's something there. We're all looking for somebody to give us a hug. And I know that sounds touchy feely in, in, in the most, you know, highest level of touchy feely. But again, remember, we are walking around with PSD, PS, PTSD symptoms. And sometimes we need somebody to give us a hug. And sometimes we need somebody to give us a mental, uh, a mental affirmation that it's okay to feel what you're feeling. Uh, you know, Jamel, you, you, you spoke about all the reasons why black people are afraid to go to doctors and as well they should. Right. But at a certain point in time, we have to get a uh, we have to get past that uh, because mental wellness is a thing. And if you can't find a doctor, you need to find somebody who you can speak to, who you, it is OK to be vulnerable to. Uh, and, and, you know, Devon, you, you spoke about not be, you know, finding a doctor that looks like you. And, and that's real. And, you know, and this is, you know, I'm going to get political here. So, like, this is the reason why voting matters, right? Because being able to have health care to say, no, not this doctor, that doctor. Nope, not that doctor, this doctor. And being able to have 
the resources to say that I need to make choices about who provides my health care is important. And so when people say, I don't want to get political and stuff like that, well, when you need to go to the doctor and you can't find a black doctor that is in your network because your health care only looks like this because you decided to sit out the last election, it matters. Man, the, the chat is blowing up. The chat is blowing up when you made your frat reference. The, we got the alphas in the house. I know you're, hey, do you want to throw out what you are, sir? I know you are a proud member. I mean, it should be obvious that I'm a Sigma man. I, you know, <laughs> this is what a Sigma man looks like, right? right Come on. I am a proud member of Phi Beta Sigma. All right. Listen, I actually was writing down notes because trauma, so many young brothers are walking around tra tra traumatized from experiences and PTSD is, is real. And I appreciate you all talking about it and leading us to our last question of the night, which you all alluded to, but I wanted to talk about love. All aboard the love train. Don't need no baggage, just get on board. The love train and the engine that makes that train go back, forward, side to side, is what hopefully gets us to that destination Dr. King spoke about, the beloved community. So gentlemen, here's a question I have. There are so many black men that are walking around this earth have been miseducated on what healthy love looks like. And that's just not black men. We live in a culture that promotes vainglory, that is uh, all about the me, 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 instead of the collective we, we, we. And we oftentimes misuse love in our relationships, friendships, partnerships. It's not just a black male issue, but I'm going to ask you, gentlemen, how can we foster healthy dialogues? And you guys alluded to before with the, the power of hugs and, and affirmations. Words have power, ways in which we can form community with our words and our deeds. So please tell me, um, who didn't go first? Hayden, let's do it with you because you haven't started first yet. I'll, I'll throw this to you first and we'll end with this. Dr. Cornell West says that love is what justice looks like in public. So how do we make love a public, uh, a com how, how do we form love and shape love in our wide variety of experiences and relationships during our daily activities, sir? I will leave that to you uh, to start us off with. Go ahead. You know, it's, it's really interesting. Um, it's funny that you start with me with love because uh, if you, the person that I am now, the man that I am now is very different than the man that I was when I graduated from Baruch and as well I should be, right? Because if you expect me to be the same person 20 years down the line, then you don't expect that I've grown. And so I've grown, right? And, and, and in growing and also in, in going to therapy, like, like I said, I've, I'm, a, I'm a counselor. So I also believe in therapy. I understood, I got to the point where I understood what love means and what it means to manifest that love and what it, what it means to actually, uh, you know, really embrace that. Uh, and so the problem is, not just for black men, men as in general have been given all of these social cues as to what it means to be a man. And a lot of that is, is steeped in misogyny and a lot of that is, is steeped in uh, this affirmation that uh, conquest equals, uh, you know, the, the ability to really say that I'm, I'm a better man than you because of all of these different kinds of conquest. And so when you get to the point and as, you know, you know, and you mature and you push out and you push forward into your maturation, you understand that there is a bigger thing that you can achieve uh, in order to, to, to uh, claim manhood, right? And it's not just the sexual exploits and it's not just uh, being able to be dominant um, because what it is is being able to share your life with somebody who understands who, you, right? It is really understanding where in the world uh, the pairing of people can move forward as long as they understand each other. And that's, again, you know, very, you know, rainbows and puffy and all the rest of that stuff. But it's so real because, uh, you know, uh, one, a, a person once told me, it's like, you marry your best friend, marry your best friend and, and you'll have, you know, a, a wonderful marriage and stuff like that. And, and that sounds like something that everybody should ascribe to, but unless we start to get past the temptation of, and, and the temptation comes from a number of different places, right? We turn on TV and it's like, uh, oh, that's, that's the guy that everybody wants to be like, and he's got this conquest and that conquest and the other conquest. But I do think 
and that we are beginning to start to see a lot of different social cues from a lot of different places in the media. We have television shows that, that show black men doing things that are different than just betting a bunch of women, right? And, or, you know, or, or, you know and, and it's starting to round out and that comes from being able to have more uh, black producers, more black actors, more black directors. And so when we start to see those images start to on the celluloid and, and in front of us, uh, it gives people who are now trying to figure out what it means to be a mature man in today's society more breath, right? Um, but the other piece of it too is that the there is also a false narrative about the fact that uh, black uh, men don't have uh, black influences, you know, in front of them, right? That we all come from single mother homes or single parent homes, and and that's just not true, right? The, the black family unit, whereas it's taken a lot of hits, there are plenty of examples, even if it's not in your own, in your own family, there are plenty of examples in every single neighborhood of what it means to be a good black man, right? And, and the narrative comes from outside of our communities and gets pushed down onto us so that we self-doubt, so that we don't believe that we can be anything great, that we don't believe that we can ascribe to these, these higher levels of maturity. Uh, and, but I'm here to tell you that like the black community has plenty of them. I have uh, all of, I, I can honestly say that the vast majority of my male friends are in relationships that are strong and stable and, and, and and they have families that are quite different than the narrative that you see in certain places, in certain movies and certain television shows. And so I think that we have to get to the point where we rewrite the narrative. And, uh, and you know, I, I've mentioned movies and television, but that's really where you see it if you don't see it next, next door to you or in your own home, right? And so it's again, rewriting that narrative and being the ones that tell our own stories and tell those stories in a positive way. Oh man, Hayden, thank you so much. We need agency and control over our story and narrative. And I definitely agree with you, sir. Going to ask Mr. Devon to answer that same question, sir. I already stated if you need me to. I asked, um, you know, how do we change the narrative or how do we have a healthy understanding and discussion of, and Charles put it in the chat. I should have included this as well. Self-love as well as love for others and, and love for partners and, and, and relationships, but just love and how we can communicate that as black men in this society. The floor is yours. Mm -hmm. I would say <clears throat> empathy. Empathy is very important as far as it goes for loving others. So many people go through so many different walks of life and you have no idea what anyone goes has gone through in their life and what they're going through that day. So when you see someone or hear something about someone Many of us are quick to judge. We're quick to point the finger at someone and say, oh, you're doing X, Y, and Z, or you're doing da, 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 and laugh about it and take it as a joke. Um, when they may be where they are because of, you know, something stemming from somewhere else. So I'll give you like a perfect example, you know. Um, maybe someone ends up getting kicked out of their home. They get evicted from their home. And then... Because of that, now they don't have a home, they're homeless. They start having mental health um, you know, issues. Um, where am I gonna eat? Where am I gonna sleep tonight? Am I going to be safe? And from there, people look for coping mechanisms and they may not be the healthiest. So they resort to <laughs> substance abuse, you know, um, injecting or smoking, whatever the case may be. And then someone walks down the street and sees that person and says, oh, that person is a drug addict, you know? How did they get there? How did they get there? It wasn't by choice. Maybe they got fired from their job because, you know, the job was going through hard times and they didn't have family members like that. So they couldn't get a loan to get, you know, pay off their rent, which spiraled down to where they are now. Not having empathy makes you quick to judge a person like that. If you want to be able to love someone, think about the different scenarios that got them to where they are, why they are where they are now. 
whether it be in a good way of where they are or in a terrible way of, you know, they're in a bad situation, you know, in between a rock and a hard place. So empathy plays a key role in not understanding it, not judging a book by its cover, you know, speaking with people on certain things while they may be going through something. And through that, you can peel back the layers of the onion and understand what the root of that is and then be able to help them so that they won't be in that predicament. That's what love is as far as it goes for loving others. And to a degree yourself, I think that self-love comes with understanding who you are and, you know, what makes you who you are, you know, whether it be you're inside of a bad situation, uh, you know, or not the best situation. We're always, you know, I think, I think as humans, we're always going to want more. And when you're, you know, making a billion dollars, you see all these people out here making a billion dollars and they have money to buy anything that they want. They still want more money. They still want more money. And, you know, that goes with, you know, just, just to say the world of consumerism and other factors that go into it. Um, and, you know, you can be in a pretty good spot, you know, not that rich, but still want more. And you won't feel as though you might not love yourself until you want more. But, you know, I, I think that you have to put things into perspective and think about where you may have been five years ago or 10 years ago, or maybe even a year ago, you know, maybe you were in a house where you were about to get evicted or you didn't have food in your house, or maybe your parents left you or whatever the case may be. And then, you know, you could be a year later with a great job, uh, you know, being able to do all these great things in your life and still not love yourself. But if you take a moment to reflect back on that and see how far you've come through that journey, then you're able to say, wow, I did a pretty good job and pat yourself on the back and accept you for who you are and accept, you know, where you're going into the future um, without so much of a sense of, of greed or doing it, you know, to impress others, you know. Uh, that, that's something I think also, you know, impressing others, understanding that you're not necessarily doing it for others in the sense to, you know, maybe make them envious or whatever the case may be, but maybe from a position of uplifting them, you know, and going back and helping other people out and being a rock or maybe even just a, a social figure that people can look up to, uh, you know, that, that, that helps you love yourself and other people love you you know, when you're not spiteful or doing things to egg people on and get a reaction, uh, but doing it from a place of empathy, but also showing empathy to others, you know, that's the full circle, being able to have self-love, but then love for others because of not where they are, but where they could be and you wanting to see them in those positions of being well overall. I'm talking and I'm muted. Man, thank you so much for sharing. You need to take self-inventory. Sometimes you got to hug yourself and love yourself. I agree with you 100%. You need to look back over your life and see how far you've come and be proud of your accomplishments. Mr. Andrew, sir, you are our last uh, panelist to answer this question. Sir, let me ask you, how do we change the narrative about love in our community? How do we foster a better understanding of how it can be manifested and in particular in your experiences or in, in the vantage point of a black man, sir? The floor is yours, go ahead. Thank you. Um, so I think uh, Devon and Hayden said most of what I was was thinking. Um, so I'm sitting here, got a glass so <laughs> on this one, on, on one of my favorite subjects to talk about. Um, what I will say is the, um, that, you know, the conscious decision to to love and express love is really important. And um, why I believe it is part of a human, our humanity, it, it, unfortunately, it has, in my opinion, become this revolutionary act uh, for Black men to, to express love um, because of how vulnerable and how dangerous it might have been for us to, uh, to do that. Um, and so thinking about the, about the hugging, you know, that he even talked about, you know, so it, 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 it with, with his, um, with the guys, um, with his brothers, and it reminds me of, uh, with me and my friends, how we decided, we got to a point in our maturity that we decided that we were going to tell each other that we loved each other. 
and also hug each other. And there was nothing else. There was, it was just like, we, we needed it. And so the embraces were, were not just formality. It was just like, I, I, I need this. And then thinking about as we were transitioning into our intimate partner relationships and thinking about, okay, so then what does that look like? So how do I be able, to have, what is my expression of love look like when I need to, to listen more than talk? Um, what does it look like where I need to be, to be, I can be, to be wrong instead of forcing to be right? Um, and, and all of that um, is stuff. And also, and then also when I'm right to be, have grace in being right and not, you know, as in, a, you know, kind of, uh, uh, you know about a power and struggle dynamic where it's just like see like like I told you so it's just like well I was right this time you were right the other time you know but because we're on the same team and we love each other that we going like we won't figure this out um, and then thinking about what it looks like um, what that level looks like with uh, with children and thinking about um, you know I think we talked about we we want a lot for 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 our children, whether they are our, our born children or the children in our lives, and and so, you know, sometimes the the, the desire to to support the success um, can and that love can be expressed um, in a way that can be overbearing. So how do we kind of measure measure that? And so, um, in thinking about my my experience where. It was just like, okay, we, we, we love this child, want him to, to, to do well. And also today is not the day to like, to, to be hard. Today is the day we won't be a little softer. Today is the day we won't be hard. And you know, <laughs> then tomorrow we won't be a little bit harder with him. You know, so, so it's a, and, and you just, but, but you gotta know the personality and the people the, the, that you're dealing with. And that, and that takes love and, and, and the consciousness to, to be present to the individual personality of the, of the person that you're engaging with. And so, uh, so love, talking about love is one of my, you know, is, is, like I said, a revolutionary act and one of my most favorite topics to talk about um, because that is what I feel like is, is, is the heartbeat of what is going to get us to um, having a healthy society. And if we can't talk about it openly, then, um, then we're not, we're like, we're not, we're not going to get there. So, uh, so yeah, yeah, I'll stop there. Don't, don't stop. Mama just said that they love you. Verdell, lo they didn't say they love you, Andrew. I love to see that. I'm going to answer this question real quickly. Then we're going we're gonna to turn over. And I'm going to answer real quickly. I started with Marvin Gaye. I'm going to end with Marvin Gaye. He gave me something that changed my life. I'm going to leave you at this. He said, if you got a girl and you want her for your wife, you got to treat her good and love her all your life. Oh, that's what he told me. If I knew then what I know now. Mr. Hayden, everything would be all right. Listen, I'm going to turn this thing over to you. It's eight minutes left. Um, this has been great. I've been, man, these brothers are, can we give these brothers a round of applause? These brothers are so vulnerable. They were so candid. Their wisdom, they gave it to us. We didn't pay them. I ain't got no money. Okay, they just came here for their own, Andrew laughing at me. He came there and they gave us such nuggets of knowledge, pearls of wisdom. They did, they did not cast them before swine. We all have our uh, rakes out. We're taking them in and I'm really appreciative. Let's do this. Let's um, use the last eight minutes or so to open up space for a dialogue. Miss Allie, if you're there, is that something you would like me to kind of just pick and choose questions that come or is there a particular question box that I can turn to? I actually have a list of questions if you wouldn't mind just um, turning over the reins to me for our last few moments. Um, I just want to thank um, you again, Jamal, for being such an amazing moderator and really um, coming up with um, these thorough questions for our panelists today. And thank you again to our panelists for um, and, um, being involved in tonight's discussion. Um, so just for our um, few last minutes, uh, with um, this program, I have just a few questions. Um, the first uh, would be, um, as Black men, how do you stay compassionate for a world that um, doesn't always reflect the same compassion toward you? 
And this is all open to um, our um, panelists and our moderator as well. I, I'm just going to say, first and foremost, I figure out who deserves my compassion. Uh, not the, the entire world doesn't deserve my compassion. Uh, and so I am compassionate to my family first. I am compassionate to my friends and my circle first. And I bestow them with every bit of love that I can to them. Um, because I know that that'll be reciprocated. And I don't do it because I'm looking for reciprocation. But, you know, you, Jamel, you just used the phrase casting pearls before swine. And we are past that in this country. We are, that time is done. We have got to take care of our own while others are, are constantly interested in bringing us down. And so my compassion goes to the people who deserve it. It is the time for just willy nilly, just throwing it out to everybody who is around me is that's, that's over. Um, yeah, no. And please yeah, anyone I, uh, take it away. I completely agree with Hayden. You know, when you think about the issues that the black community goes through, that black men go through, you know, it's not a walk in the park. It's not at all. And it's not a joke. It's very serious topics that impact our life on a daily. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's good to have compassion, but also understanding who that compassion should go towards. Um, you know, identifying who those allies are, the people that will be in your corner to the very end. Uh, and those are the people who should be respected and, you know, deserve that compassion along with family members and, you know, the people who truly do care about you. It's, it's, it's tough to identify those allies, but when you do, you know, it's definitely good to give them that compassion. Um, let's just move on to our next question. If you can go back to your younger self, uh, what would you say and what would you change for him? Jamel, cut that out. What are you doing? Uh, you know, Ms. I know, Andrew, put that down. I don't know. I would, I would, uh, man, if I knew then what I know now, I would look back and tell myself to take my time, enjoy the, the moments of our youth. Right, those those seasons before we uh, because I think Mr. Hayden spoke about it as well. Society has a way of making young black boys, you know, mature and and view them and perceive them as old. I remember when I was thirteen, I looked seventeen, but I felt twenty one, and the world was approaching me in that way. So I was moving with a hyper kind of, and I was moving, moving, but take my time and enjoy my youth. I'm done. Thank you. I think that I would take more risks. Um, we we tell our children to be careful, right? And uh, because society is coming at them. And so, you know, focus on your schoolwork, get done, graduate, do this, you know, toe the line, get done. But we, and everybody else in the world is being told, yeah, yeah, sure, go try that and see how it works out for you. Fail, come back and do it again. No, go ahead and do that other thing. Fail, come back and do it. But we, have, we haven't been acculturated to take those risks. So I didn't study abroad. I didn't take those internships. I didn't take the risks that I, that would have led to even more accomplishments on my part. So I would have taken more risks and um and and not bought into the the, the reserve character that's that our our culture tells us that we have to be. With that, you know, I took risks, and I wish I took more risks. Like to to your point, like you know, um, and feeling like. You know, I, I took I took the safe, calculated risk. So I did study abroad, but I wish I would have, in addition to study, what traveled and you know, just went into the unknown. You know, like and so I've tried to to figure out, like you know, how how to do that older. But if my younger self would be like, yeah, yo, just do it. You're, you're gonna be okay. You've been equipped um, to be able to take care of yourself and figure it out and survive no matter what is thrown out thrown at you so yeah take, taking more risks and also going back to what we talked about earlier about the the, the learning and in like seeing the opportunity and, and taking advantage of opportunity and access so there were things that i had access to that i was just like nah man i'm just i'm, I'm gonna go chill or do something else and was and, and now i'm thinking about like i could have learned to do what 
and thinking about what I got to pay out of pocket to learn something that was presented in my face when I was a teenager that I could have just scooped up. And now as, you know, 42 year old man, I got to pay to learn something I could learn for free, you know, at 15. So that's, that's what I would say to myself. Um, our following question, um, what are you all um, each doing um, to change the narrative of what society has deemed black men to be? I can kick it off. Uh, so as was, what was mentioned before from Neftali, I'm a part of an organization known as 100 Roses from Concrete. It's a, uh, it's a organization within uh, marketing PR, um, basically a marketing industry. And what we do is we create campaigns uh, to basically help out people of color that are within our industry, but, you know, also just men of color is, is, is sort of like a, like a, you know, the, the, a group and organization that just gets that, 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 that brotherhood aspect of what black men need. And I, I think that we're changing the narrative within our industries through showing, you know, that we're a group of people at many different levels in our career. You know, you have people there that are part of the C-suite and you have people that are in entry level positions. But at the same time, you know, we're coming together, experience, uh, sharing our experiences, our knowledge, uh, to build campaigns and spread awareness of what it's like to be a black man or a person of color or man of color within our industries uh, and the pain points that we go through and what we can do to make it so that there are more people that look like us within our industry, showing them that, you know, you shouldn't necessarily have unconscious or conscious bias, that you shouldn't automatically assume that, you know, we're the angry black man because we do say X, Y, and Z, or, you know, that we shouldn't necessarily have to change who we are within the workplace, uh, you know, to make others feel comfortable. You know, that makes me feel uncomfortable when I have to make others feel comfortable by making myself feel uncomfortable, that's uncomfortable. So being able to share those experiences and can make campaigns around that and changing the narrative on that uh, matters a lot. Uh, but, you know, just being able to identify that and, you know, work towards what is it that we can do so that we can shift that narrative? Who are the right people that we need to speak to? Uh, how can we spread this to a wider audience to get to those who are ignorant, unfortunately? Uh, for me, it's really trying to be successful in different things that are not traditional for a Black man. Uh, I'm a photographer. This is one of my pieces back here. So I want to be successful as a photographer. I work in education and higher education. There are not a lot of Black men in higher education. So doing things in that realm, a podcaster, uh, you know, being a very active and involved dad, but showing different ways that black men can manifest themselves and to show success and, and show, uh, you know, a, a certain level of maturity, I think really changes the narrative where the only thing that you can uh, ascribe to success is like you ha you're in the C-suite like Devon talked about, but just also showing us getting involved in a number of different things, everything from geek culture and comic books and all the rest of that stuff to being gentle and playing with your daughter in the park. So just, just doing all of the things, not just the one few boxes that they allow us to be in. Okay, and our last question, um, what would you say, um, in your opinion, we can all do to uh, support black men and men of color? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to prick on Andrew because he hasn't spoken yet. <laughs> um, I'd say be, be, be curious about whatever behavior that you're, that you're witnessing, seeing, and not just ascribe it to um, whatever we've been told. So, uh, you know, a lot of in, in the clinical work that I've done, we talk a lot about a resistant client and thinking about, well, resistant 
is defined by who, by whom, you know? So I, I think is, I, so I would like for, for folks to be curious about um, why I'm showing up the way I'm showing up. And instead of just saying, well, this student or this person is just not interested or I can't work with them or they're angry or they're intolerable. Um, so just the curiosity exploration and going back to the love and just approaching it and, and seeing me in, in that way and seeing black men in that way. I'm going to make my input from um, my perspective, which is grounded in my Christian faith. The Bible tells us to, to see that we are our brother's keeper. And I would be more than remiss if I didn't include that in, in my closing remarks that Andrew's my brother, Hayden is my brother, uh, Davon's my brother. And if I see a brother that's in struggle, it's my obligation to, if I have it within my means, extend my hand to reach and help my brother out. And um, I think that's something we need. Too often crabs in the barrel mentalities has left to divide and conquer within the community and black men at odds with black men when we should be uniting and working to build our communities up. So acknowledging, am I my brother's keeper? Yes, I am. Thank you. For me, the, the, the one thing that is important is to allow black men to show up as, as Andrew talked about, but not be surprised that that's how they're showing up, right? Being able to, if they are an artist, it's like, oh, well, I've, I've never seen a black man do that. No just allow them to be and support what it is that they're going through. Uh, and, and, you know, we, we talk about the crabs in the barrel and, and the, the, the greatest thing that I ever read about that, uh, that, um, that, that statement is that the natural habitat for a crab is not a barrel, right? Somebody had to put them in the barrel. And so when we allow us to focus on the fact that people are trying to get out of the, the crabs are trying to get out of the barrel, we lose sight of the fact that somebody put them in the barrel and somebody puts us in a situation where we are in competition with each other. And when we start, when that one piece is turned and we recognize that we are not in, I am not in competition with any of these people. And if they, even if they went down the exact same career path, same road, same, we are not in competition. I am here to build all of these people up and I am here to support them how they show up. And when that happens, that's when we take steps forward. That was great. Devon, do you have any um, additional um, insider feedback that you'd like to give for that question? Um, you guys all hit it on the head, you know. <laughs> Uh, I, I can't I can't think of much. I think I think that, you know, just 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 understanding who we are and allowing us to, you know, live our lives, not having an expectation that we should, you know, fit into certain molds because of, you know, the way we are. So like if you're a tall black dude, for example, oh, you should play basketball. No, do what Hayden is doing. You know, if that person likes photography let them pursue a path in photography don't necessarily pigeonhole them or you know hype them up for something that they may not be passionate about because that's what brings happiness when you're able to do something or do work that doesn't necessarily feel like work or do something that makes you happy at the end of the day that you can go to bed at night or wake up the next morning feeling very 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 uh happy to do so I would say just, you know, I don't pigeonhole us to do certain things that, you know, the media may portray or that's just like super popular, whatever the case may be. You know, if that person wants to do photography, let them do photography, you know, if they're Black. Do things that aren't necessarily expected of us so that the people that come after us who are, who are also interested in that and looking for role models can look towards that person instead of someone who doesn't necessarily look like them, you know? Great, thank you. Um, and with that, um, I think we're being a close to this evening. I just want to thank um, our moderator, um, Jamel Coy Hudson, one more time. Uh, thank you to our panelists, Hayden Green, Andrew Lawton, and um, Devon Thompson for lending their time uh, and their insight to this conversation. And I want to thank um, all of our guests that we have here this evening. And of course, my colleague, Nephilie Danier, who has been, you know, very instrumental in bringing everyone together 
tonight. Um, and just make sure that you visit our alumni website for future virtual events and we'll see you soon. Bye. Good night, everyone.